Volga Czernish uh, is uh, an assistant uh, professor uh, from uh, Massachusetts, Institu um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, she uh, is uh, in her main areas of uh, uh, research focus on political economy, political behavior, Eastern Europe, Holocaust, World War II, uh, ethnic politics, authoritarianism, politics and history, and migration. So some of these topics will definitely be covered in uh, our presentations today. Volga is originally from um, Grodna, from Belarus. She received her PhD from Harvard University a few years ago, and uh, now she is publishing in various influential uh, political science journals. Volga, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Um, I'm very happy to chair uh, our last panel for the day on politics and identity. Uh, I want to make a quick announcement that our program has changed slightly. Unfortunately, Alexander Kazako uh, cannot join us due to scheduling conflicts. However, we will have two exciting presentations coming up. Um, from which we all will learn a lot. Our first speaker is Dr. Sasha Razor, uh, who will uh, give a talk on articulations of Belarusian national identities in 2020. Uh, Dr. Razor is a native of Belarus and an alumna of the UCLA Department of Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies. In June 2020, she completed her dissertation titled we Were the River, Screenwriters of the Left Front of the Arts, 1923-1931. Besides the avant-garde cinema and literature, her research interests focus on Belarusian and Ukrainian literature and culture, post-colonialism, visual arts, diasporic and women's studies. In 2020, Dr. Reza received um, a CIS internship grant and completed her internship at the Museum of Russian Culture in San Francisco. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Razor, uh, who will now uh, share her screen. And I will talk about the articulations of the Belarusian national identity. Okay, all good. So in her article titled The Heuristics and Poetics of Belarusian Revolution, European Humanities Philosopher, European Humanities University philosopher Tatiana Shitsova writes that thinking and writing about the recent events in Belarus requires a new language and outer description models that venture beyond the dichotomy of the national and post-national. She points the following new modalities of the Belarusian revolution, including the universal political program of Svetlana Tikhanovska, decentralized leadership, and the asymmetric response to violence and the moral ethical dimensions of the protests. Additionally, she posits the birth of the Belarusian nation, political nation via two moments, the democratization of political institutions and revival of Belarusian historic cultural heritage. This presentation responds to Shitsova's suggestion. I propose a framework to examine the Belarusian historical cultural heritage that came to the fore in these events. In particular, I argue that by forming protest communities and participating in the protest rituals, Belarusians ignited a powerful process of culture heritage revitalization. In evaluating the myriad of cultural production that took place during this transitional moment, one term that instantly comes to mind is the concept of creative effervescence theorized by French sociologist Emile Durkheim and his classic study, Elementary Forms of Religious Life, which he wrote back in um, 1912, and I quote, under the influence of some great collective shock in certain historical periods, social interactions become much more frequent and active. Individuals seek one another out and come together more. The result of the general effervescence that is characteristic of revolutionary and all creative epochs. The result of that heightened activity is a general stimulation of individual energies. People live differently and more frequently than in normal times. The changes are not simple of nuance or degree. The man himself becomes something other than what he was. And indeed, in the past six months, we have seen Belarusians coming together as a community. The cultural production that emerged from these events is truly unprecedented um, 
in its scale and includes, but is not limited to handmade flags, protest signs, musical performances, poetry, theater, street art, as well as performances and art disseminated in the digital sphere. So how do we begin to conceptualize this cultural explosion, especially while the archive of the protest culture remains a process, um, a process in the making? How do we make sense of various folds of the protest identities, such as pre-Soviet, Soviet, and post-Soviet? How do we, as researchers, Sorry, uh, sorry Sasha, can, can, we, can you stop for a moment? Sasha, could you stop for a moment? I think we missed the last two, the last one minute, and I think maybe some paper was moving across the mic on the computer. And maybe it makes sense actually to turn off your video because there is something with uh, with your internet connection. So if you could turn your video off, the, pr the presentation should stay on the screen. Uh, okay. Yeah, and try not to touch the microphone area with your papers. Thanks. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so um, so in the past six months, we have seen the unprecedented explosion of the protest art. And to conceptualize it, I propose the following methodology. First of all, to work with the protest art, we need to determine um, the place of specific works in the protest culture corpus. Secondly, it is very important to evaluate this works within the broader cultural context of the past decades. And thirdly, to correlate them to the global transnational trends. It is my hope that such analysis will highlight the complexity of the creative energies released by the protest and contribute to current scholarship by moving the discussion beyond the categories of purely national or post-national. And in the... Um, in the longer article that I'm writing, I'm examining five distinct protest rituals, such as neighborhood flags, because people carry flags to the protest, protest chants, and I've collected them, I have a collection, protest songs, and I am creating the protest um, performance music video, which I'm uploading online, dances and embroideries. However, in the time that remains, I, would like to examine, um, I would like to focus on just one aspect of the articulations of Belarusian identity in this protest, and namely the embroideries. I would also like to mention that I'm preparing an online exhibition of Rufina Baslova's artwork at UCLA, which will open on March 3rd with a discussion panel, and you can see the registration link on this slide. Um, the exhibition is titled The History of Belarusian Vyshevank, and the title is a pun combining two words, embroidered shirt, Vyshevank, and to survive, Vyshevat. Okay, so even though embroideries occupy a relatively marginal place in the entirety of the protest corpus, their dissemination online has a symbolic impact. This medium captured the public imagination in the first days of the protest following the elections when artwork from the Instagram account of Prague-based Belarusian artist Rufina Baslova made the rounds on social media appearing not only in the feeds of ordinary Belarusians, including my own, but also across a diverse spectrum of media outlets, including Radio Prague International, Die Welt, Gazeta Vyborcha, Belarusian Radio Svoboda, Medusa, The Moscow Times, the Russian version of Republic, the Culver Journal, the Global Voices, among others. And I've just interviewed Rufina from Chrysalis Mag, which is a new Belarusian contemporary art journal that also serves as a repository of the protest art images. Additionally, Rufina's art appeared on the cover of two publications, the September issue of the EFLUX journal and December publication of poet Julia Timofeeva's protest diary. It is not surprising that Baslova's digital comic news collages depicting the events of the Belarusian revolution went viral. I would like to refer my listeners to an, to an excellent article by sociologist Yelena Gapova entitled Things to Have for Belarusian Rebranding the Nation via Online Participation, in which Gapova analyzes the online user-led content creation of ethnic ornaments as the semiotic space where ideas about nationhood are packaged, in quotes. Gapova argues that the online communities reinvent the meaning of the Vyshevanka as a national product and thus recreate their group solidarity and social cohesion. Additionally, she connects the popularity of Vyshevanka to a global trend of nation building in the post-socialist region. 
my research crosses from the sphere of mass culture into the craftivism or political artistic embroideries, which, as I argue, emerged in 2020 as a Belarusian protest ritual of a new kind that is both preconditioned by the domestic art trends of the past decades and resonates with the global transnational art narratives, as my further analysis will demonstrate. Evaluating the use of embroidery within the broader context of post-Soviet contemporary art in Belarus reveals that the particular appeal to nationhood is relatively new and emerged only within the past couple of years. Let me show you some examples of the pre-protest artwork to illustrate its evolution. And all my slides are arranged chronologically. For example, one can mention Alexei Lunyov's project Shit Clouds, and many know Alexei's other work, Nyutsuhanyama, which is a direct um, citation from um, Valentino Kudovich's the book, The Code of Absence. And here you see some elements of embroidery in Jeanne Gladko's exhibition titled Inciting Force, which took place in 2012. Um, there is also a very interesting project. It's a video art installation by Ole Sosnovska, which she did in 2015. And you can see that none of these embroideries are marked. Another project by Anna Bundeleva, which is not folksy per se, and then comes 2017, and we do have a um, new music label Tradice, which was launched and is produced by a very important musician of the Belarusian revival, Serzhuk Dogushov, and this is Vasilisa Palanina's commercial work, but she's a very talented, interesting young artist who also works and engages embroidery motifs. And then this is the 2019 um, project by Tiemra titled Spachina, which engages directly with the folk heritage. As we can see, the marked Belarusian folk motifs only appear in the work of Palianina and Tiemra relatively recently. However, in the August of 19, oh, 2020, the idea of political embroidery has been actively implemented on several art platforms simultaneously. I have already mentioned Rufina Baslova, who is working from Prague. So she is the actual Czech puppeteer of the Belarusian revolution. Um, but also from August 20 to August 26, um, the Unis Kladova Gallery launched um, the hashtag Zautra Kozhny Dien, Tomorrow's Everyday Project, within which more than 10 artists offered their sketches to create the joint canvas embroidery about the August events in the capital. It was a community documentary embroidery practice and the one that, and one of the last activities in the gallery's existence. On November 5, <clears throat> Uh, another event took place titled Embroidery Practices, an online workshop on crafting wisdom by the Minsk artist Lesia Pcholka. And Lesia, larger project deals with researching family archives and embroidering women maiden names on the archival prints. And she actually compared the weddings that take place during the protests in Minsk right now to the wartime weddings which took place in Belarus in, during World War II. Published on Facebook, the collages of a German-based artist, Marina Naprushkina, stand somewhat apart. They were conceived during the Zautra Kozhny Dien project, and then she returned to Germany and started embroidering, creating embroideries on the very marked backgrounds of the school notebooks that connotate something else altogether. And there are at least two more artists who are working on embroidery projects right now. So this is picking up and I believe there will be more art coming from Belarus. As we can see galvanized by the protests, the entire community of the Belarusian embroiderers has emerged among the country's artists documenting the events that took place and working with such themes as feminism, trauma and memory. Whereas the dissemination of com commercial ethnic ornaments in the dig digital sphere works to harness the idea of a nation, contemporary art, even protest art, which is usually more straightforward, tends to engage with ad additional referential frames. And I will take Baslova's embroidered collages as an example to demonstrate how this works. On the surface, Rufina speaks directly about creating an embroidered epic of the Belarusian revolution in which each tableau corresponds to an episode in its recent history. She specifically uses the words nation and people's art. 
but she also engages with the narratives of feminism and violence, which in her case appear to be experientially and not theoretically driven. In a recent interview which I conducted, and um, this part is not published, she stated that her inspiration came from attending the museums of folk art across Europe, and that she was not very familiar with the work of Western textile artists or feminists of the third and second waves. Another aspect worth mentioning is the production modality. If Baslova's art offers a concept of nationhood, then it is one that is increasingly transnational, mobile, and inclusive. This artwork is being produced by a Belarusian immigrant in Prague. The exhibition is curated by a Belarusian immigrant in Los Angeles, and the merchandise, which is completely unrelated, is handled by an immigrant in St. Petersburg, Russia. We cannot even call this work a cultural expert because the project originated within a Czech art program. It exists on the global art market from the onset and appear, appeals to people with complex shared identities. One more aspect that I would like to mention is the resonance of Baslova's work with other craftivist projects and cultural revival narratives around the globe. To give you just one example, in the summer of 2020, Time magazine published an embroidery work by Neka Jones, an American artist of Barbadian heritage who was active in the Black Lives Matter movement and who calls for the new American revolution. Similarly, Baslova's work communicates the idea of nationhood and calls for the end of violence and democratic changes in Belarus. In summary, I have discussed two things today. I touched on the framework and the methodology for researching protest art that would move beyond the, move the discussion beyond the dichotomy of national versus post-national. In evaluating various expressions of Belarusian heritage culture and protest rituals, I offered to examine their position vis-a-vis -vis the protest corpus, the broader domestic cultural context of the past decades, as well as transnational trends. Secondly, I examined the case study of political embroideries produced by Belarusian contemporary artists inside and outside the country. Initially conceived as a return to an archaic pre-written code rooted in both Belarusian traditional culture and articulation the nation building momentum, these new embroideries also go beyond the discourse of national revival and dovetail into international art narratives such as feminism, activism, memory, and trauma, thus generating the new language and descriptive categories that Tatiana Shitsova has called for. Prepared by a decade worth of cultural production, the medium of embroidery was ignited by the protests and transformed, responding to the urgency of the situation in the country. After all, the needle and the thread, along with flags, chants, and music, have proven themselves viable cultural weapons of Belarusian revival. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Razor. Um, also, perfect timing. Uh, I just want to make a quick announcement that uh, you know we will be accepting questions after the second presentation. But if you already have some please send them to me via chat uh, or to everyone via chat and I will also call on you. Um, so I am now happy to announce our second presenter, Dr. Uh, Joanna Getka, who will talk about, um, who will, he will give a presentation titled Banner as a tool for building the Belarusian identity of resistance. Uh, Dr. Getka is the head of the Department of Intercultural Studies in Central and Eastern Europe at the University of Warsaw. Um, she uh, is an expert on Belarusian and cultural philology, and she has authored many monographs and articles on literary culture of the Belarusian and Ukrainian cultural area and on the formation of modern cultural identity of Belarusians and Ukrainians. Uh, I can point uh, only some points yeah, of the problem uh, because, uh, as you can imagine, problem is very wide. And my speech is built on um, social reactions uh, expressed uh, on banners during the protest after the uh, 2020 uh, presidential elections. Massiveness of protests uh, in 2020 highlighted all the weaknesses of uh, official propaganda machine. The banners carried by protesters uh, exposed not only the deficit of uh, through 
of truth in relations uh, relations with between the government and society but they also ridicule the organizational efforts made by the presidential center as well uh, as the main threats of uh, official propaganda destroying its foundations regardless uh, of uh, the political solution uh, the current crisis will have long lasting political social and cultural consequence. Crisis undermined uh, the essence of the system with Bachka, with Father Lukashenko as a guarantee of stability and social peace in Belarus. This uh, image was pushed into the background. In the foreground, we have now from the beginning of the protest, a society rebelled against the values offered by Lukashenko. The image of Belarus stability, the social peace, uh, the social peace uh, reigning there and the president's success uh, in this field, which uh, had been uh, created over twenty over the past 26 years, had been ruined. Now, uh, new media and communications technologies, internet, smartphones and others, diversified the methods of social communication. The protests created a specific type of street visual counter-propaganda that is a kind of dialogue between uh, with the official narrative and uh, it is also direct contact with the recipient. The banner and posters using uh, visual stimuli and text are the streets response to manipulation and disinformation uh, disseminated by politician, politician, politicians and uh, state media. How to do next slide? Excuse me, because I don't know. Uh, Can you uh, drag it? Uh, to the next one, maybe, or click uh, through the arrows, yeah. arrows at the bottom, maybe. If you just point your mouse on it a bit lower. Hmm. If you do it as, as you don't know, oh, you don't okay, do okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> uh, it came. I don't know. Um, always uh, it was working, but now there is there was some problems. And click uh, on the okay. second slide. Ah, right. Okay, there is something. Wrong. Okay, so wait a second. Yeah, just click one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. What's here? Okay. okay, maybe this would be okay now. Uh, okay, the forms of uh, activity of marginals um, by the system society uh, that we can observe today break both the, soci the sociological and uh, image and the paradigm used to describe this society. Uh, if since the presidential elections um, 2006, uh, the generation conflict was recognized as the main factor of social change in Belarus, uh, in the 2000, uh, 2020 elections campaign show, uh, show an unprecedented uh, scale of the protest. The slogan, you will not break young, young at heart, carried by pensioners, uh, is becoming a kind of symbol. Uh, as a result, a stereotypical sociological image of Lukashenko's opponent as a young, educated, West-oriented resident of Minsk has collapsed. Today, protests are attended by young and old, old students and uh, retires, workers from Minsk, Grodno, Brest, Vitebsk, Soligorsk and uh, other cities. Okay, uh, banner technology. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's the slogan uh, on the background, not the foreground. Uh, banner technology as uh, al alternative form of uh, information source and social communication pathway is simple. The official narrative is cropped and the text presented on the banner uh, refers to selected fragment of Belarusian reality. Lukashenko's policy is rejected as a base um, on lie. The brevity and uh, conciseness, dynamism and timelines 
uh, of the presented text has uh, the optimal effect. Uh, it presents both a different through reaching uh, a wider audience, not only in real space, but also in a virtual one uh, through independent internet and social media. A group of recipients who understand uh, the applied cultural codes uh, is constantly expanding. At the same time, there is a growing social resistance uh, to official lies and uh, systemic oppressions. The awareness uh, and attitudes of passive society are replaced by the attitude of uh, alternative uh, dialogue society. The mechanism of constructive this type of identity was characterized by uh, Spanish social, sociologist uh, Manuel Castells, uh, and it consists uh, in excluding to uh, excluding the excluding by the excluded. Yeah, so it is revising the assessments and categories of operational discourse, and thus it is building a sense of community of common values. So the dominant postulate on value uh, in the uh, subjectivity of society, symbolized by slogan uh, of free elections, uh, that uh, constantly accompanies the protesters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, banner technology, uh, um, this um, archaic dealer system uh, stuck, we would say, in a pre-internet cultural re reality. For the last 26 years, day by day, it manifests stability and determination to defend itself, even uh, at the expense of the country's sovereignty. Uh, the information effort is supposed to create the um, appearance of a stable, strong position of the dictator. Propaganda shows uh, and myths, especially the myth of uh, Bachka, the father of the nation, uh, has lost defender uh, of the country, uh, are the pillars of stability of Lukashenko regime. The system, of course, uh, also use modern technologies, social networks and new media, uh, help analyze public moods, uh, identify the cause of um, this uh, satisfaction, and uh, then show those uh, show, do, uh, show those things in a far, um, far, favorable uh, light. Uh, in addition, acting uh, through its own provocateurs through trolls, uh, the system even encourage opponents to discharge their, their emotion, hoping to reduce readiness. Uh, to protest in the street. However, those, um, those actions are ineffective. Uh, Alexander Lukashenko transformed his own uh, style of governing of, governing of, uh, uh, of the country into some kind of uh, reality show. Uh, and the society became a kind of society of spectacle. Uh, the central character of this show is obviously Lukashenko. He makes an important decision. Uh, he implements them immediately. Uh, he overcomes various obstacles. He fights with cunning opponents uh, in front uh, of the uh, TV viewers. He push, uh, punished the companies, the directors, dismiss high officials, and uh, announce uh, his uh, decision. This kind of media spectacles are obviously not aimed to solving real problems, but um, building relations with society or more precisely uh, strengthening power over it. Uh, the propaganda apparatus is, uh, is uh, coordinated with uh, repression apparatus. So that's why there is, uh, there is a straight answer. Uh, yeah, uh, journalists who describe real um, situation or reality other than, uh, than the official uh, media uh, show uh, are arrested from August to December to, to uh, 220, uh, almost 400 journalists were detained and lots of them were sentenced uh, to imprisonment. Today we have also uh, 
the um, yeah the judgment uh, judge to on two uh, journalists on uh, from uh, Bielsat. Uh, criticism, big criticism was raised by the import of uh, Russian uh, propagandists. As a result, in addition to slogans, drug addict with the nations or uh, decent prostitute will get no some uh, good, uh, good drug addict, uh, that were answered on Lukashenko characters of today, um, Belarusian society or Belarusian protesters. Uh, there were also um, slogans, will you bring women from Russia to, or uh, Russia today, Haga tomorrow. Uh, these kinds of reaction uh, from the resistance community shows the ineffectiveness of official propaganda and a social cultural chance to um, change uh, that state propagandist cannot keep up with. Opponents uh, of the regime not only do not succumb the television propaganda uncrit uncritically, they verify the information provided the, uh, there and confront it with reality. Uh, there are conscious user of media, conscious participants of even uh, of events, and um, they react very, very uh, vividly to all lies and uh, manipulations. Good, um, a good example of these uh, kind reactions was uh, uh, was uh, response to a television news about big march on August uh, twenty two. Uh, the route of presidential helicopter from uh, flight from uh, which the shots uh, to this um, television material were uh, made were taken was planned so that only a part of protesting could be seen. In the TV report, Belarusians could also heard that uh, comment uh, by Lukashenko that uh, called protesters uh, rats flaring from the, uh, from the police. Uh, uh, Long-lasting protests uh, highlighted um, the understanding uh, of the importance of civic solidarity that necessary that is necessary for uh, for the action. Uh, in this way, the process of shaping uh, the residence uh, resistance society uh, continues. Dominant role here is played by civil groups that are capable to. Uh, articulating uh, and defending their own interests. The defense, uh, the defense of uh, Belarusian symbolism is an important, but not only one, dimensions of uh, the identity of resistance. Civil, uh, civic activism inspires the respect of traditions and Belarusian language. In the second half of November uh, 2020, after the brutal pacifications of uh, demonstrations, the tactic was uh, changed. People gathered uh, directly in their backgrounds. Uh, in addition, a self-help uh, and warning system were launched. Protesters um, could use um, safe means of transport, participants Excuse me. Participants, uh, uh, participants. Uh, excuse me. Uh, participants of March uh, could uh, could use uh, could um, uh, were uh, were informed where the police uh, is uh, gathering when Mon Mon is gathering. So. Uh, but then uh, using the white, red and white flags uh, carried by demonstrators using them uh, as a, per, a peculiar hallmark uh, have become dangerous. So uh, here uh, and there they are replaced by, uh, by ambiguous slogans and flags or some uh, kind of, uh, some kind of uh, uh, other uh, methods of show uh, the national uh, national symbols. Uh, the counter propaganda carried on the banners is a direct response to narrative of rolling camp. Uh, it is the opposition for BS uh, official communication. Contemporary Belarusian anti-propaganda uh, has a clear 
counter uh, cultural background. Contrary to state propaganda built with the use of a language of, con a language of confrontation, it amazes with a richness of, um, of style and uh, associations. Anti-propaganda is kept uh, in very playful tone, uh, often mocking. Uh, sometimes it takes uh, a form of some kind of philosophical uh, memento, for example, from love to hate one aftozak, that's mean one uh, police uh, car. It also testifies the associations, um, eruditions of, uh, of its authors, uh, knowledge of domestic and foreign realities. Uh, they, um, for example, willingly use English, yeah, like Sasha, women uh, are coming, or pseudo English slogan, you have it here uh, in the middle or, uh, or um, Russian language classics, including paraphrase of uh, Osta Berden's uh, words from Ilf E. Pietrov uh, book. Uh, there was, uh, there was a statement that ice is move, uh, gentlemen's ice is moving. And here we have uh, yeah, gentlemen, uh, old man is moving. Yeah, uh, so um, this is a kind of uh, um, kind of this uh, possibility of this uh, reaction. Uh, massive and uh, sustained protest uh, changed the system. They undermined its foundations. Uh, in the socio-political uh, dimension, they are an attempt, um, attempt to free society from the monopolistic power, uh, power of Lukashenko. If social-cultural dimension, they are the catalyst of uh, maturation of um, civil society. It arises faster than uh, faster than institutionally organized political opposition. Uh, Belarus active social group uh, as the cultural base of the resistance uh, and the civil identity they built uh, constitute, a, a constitute a trap, uh, a trap for the um, uh, for the dictatorial regime. Uh, the experience accumulated by the society in view the um, level of non-acceptance of the system will certainly be used in the future. Uh, in fact, it is uh, in, inevitable. Uh, the system does uh, not solve long-term problem, social problem, economic problem, and uh, political problem, but only mask them and using, using all the time the same methods, yeah? the propaganda, social engineering, and repression. And as we see, society um, doesn't deal with it. Yeah? And uh, they, are not, uh, they are not the cattle, herds, and cowards. Yeah? They are living nations, Belarusians. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Getka. Uh, all right, so we're uh, moving into Q&A. Uh, so I would encourage all of you to raise your hand on uh, Zoom. You could do this by going to participants um, link. Uh, also feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. And uh, I will ask the first one, uh, which has to do with me being a political scientist. So uh, for the longest time, I've been uh, reading assessments that claim that weak national identity is the reason for uh, continued authoritarianism, passive civil society, uh, and dependence on Russia and Belarus. And um, I'm um, curious, you know, whether there is any merit in uh, this argument, or was this a completely misguided view? And should we see uh, national identity as um, a product of democratization or really its cause. So anything you could say about national identity and uh, re uh, views on regime, democracy and civic participation would be most welcome. Uh, and it's a question for both panelists. So feel free to unmute, unmute and uh, speak up. Uh... I think that uh, we um, should stop thinking about uh, nations 
uh, in this uh, sense uh, that we know from um, like a term from the 19th century. Yeah, now uh, there is something like this, something like this is already passé, I would say. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, it is rather this um, some kind of um, nationality or something. Like this is. Um, uh, and especially in Belarus, it's um, that has uh, its factors yeah, of uh, growing yeah, because uh, uh, it is society that uh, is built uh, not only on ethnic yeah, Belarusians, but it is also uh, those um, people uh, who um, stayed there after the uh, collapse of uh, Soviet Union uh, and others. So mm, we cannot uh, measure Belarusian society uh, with uh, the measure that we have uh, for uh, the other societies. And um, I think that what we see now is, uh, and uh, it is some kind of creating a new society uh, new um, um, yeah with a new society with new possibility uh, but uh, I I won't say uh, I wouldn't say that uh, the Russian society is weak or um, I don't know um, It is rather uh, it is rather propaganda of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of uh, Lukashenko centers that uh, is taken from uh, from the propaganda from the uh, Soviet time already yeah? and uh, even uh, even before yeah because it is uh, very useful uh, so I think. Uh, uh, it is, uh, yeah, the, the most important here is uh, it is impossible to measure the large society by this, uh, by this uh, uh, qualification of language of, um, I would say, um, other um, things that, uh, that we are comparing, for example, to Polish society, yeah, because uh, it is two different parts of um, growing societies. Maybe Sasha Thank would you. say something more, I would say. <laughs> Thanks. So um, we'll go to Sasha, but uh, before we do that, I also see some questions in chat, uh, which is uh, specifically to Sasha. So I'll uh, ask Ursula Woolley to unmute herself and ask the question. Um, Sure, it was a question that was uh, raised by uh, Sasha's presentation, but I guess I'd be interested to hear all your reactions to it uh, about textiles and dissent. How much do you think they work as expressions of political protest? Or do you think they're better as more general feminist dissent? Or are they perhaps problematically, and bearing in mind also recent radical dissenting textile art in Russia as well, a form of dissent that's more or less acceptable to authoritarian regimes, and it just happens that their often feminist subtext makes them also accessible internationally. And does the fact that they're intersectional and attractive uh, internationally dilute or reinforce their domestic political force and what's your current feeling or analysis about that and i completely appreciate that it might change and it's hard to pin down thank you thanks um uh, dr razor okay so hi thank you for the question also and thank you for the question olga um i will probably begin answering with the can you hear me okay yep yes so I will begin answering the second question. And um, indeed, it is difficult to pin down and this textile momentum is still a pro project in the making. And many people will, you, you will see the explosion of textile arts within the past several months because 
I spoke to several artists and people are preparing the new projects. But uh, I have a specific um, feeling that all of this is preconditioned by the development in the international textile trends. And for example, why Rufina Baslava's project became so prominent and so visible is because she was already working with it. And she was working with it this year because she did a project on it 10 years ago in her graduate school in Prague. You see, it's what we see right now is a result of the decade worth of work building up to this momentum. But the current trend is also was set by the American cross stitch embroiderers who reacted against the Donald Trump election in 2016. And this was much publicized in American media. And you can find the most wonderful um, articles about the feminist cross teachers taking down Trump's regime from the Instagram, for example. So you do have the social media booming momentum. Um, regarding Professor Chernish's question about um, the ethnic identities and nationalism, I do completely agree with um, Dr. Getka that the civic nationalism is what should be discussed right now. However, I do have a completely different disciplinary training and perspective. You see, in Los Angeles, uh, I was trained as the language teacher and I worked with heritage speakers for many, many years. And I actually studied the heritage cultures of Los Angeles. And um, analyzing my own Belarusian culture, I do see all of us as the heritage speakers perhaps in the third and fourth generations. And what we are dealing with right now are the processes of revival and revitalization. So when people come together at the protests and the rituals, the first parallels that I had to mind as many North American powwows that I have seen, you know, it's, it's very similar process and Belarusians are not special in this case. And there are many cultures and communities who have lost their language and the ethnic rules that are reconnecting to it, but it doesn't have to be. It works as a minor culture, as a heritage culture. And with that, I am completely at peace with the nationalist tendencies and the work that we produce. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we will now go to the question from Yarek Krivoy. Uh, Yarek, please. Thanks. Yeah, my question, I think, was partially uh, answered because I was wondering what it means uh, to be uh, a Belarusian. Uh, there were studies looking at uh, uh, sort of the factors which unite Belarus, uh, Belarusians or which what, what do they have in common? And there are not that many because if you think about the language, it's not really uh, there. If you think about religion, it's not there. If you think about their... Po uh, political views it's not th really there it's quite split um, and the only thing which made everyone say yes well that's a part of my Belarusian identity is a Belarusian passport so uh, I was wondering whether you have any thoughts on that because you know passport sounds like just a formal you know document and if you give them a different passport will they have a different identity uh, so that's the first question and the second question about uh, symbolism. We we now see um, uh, attempts of the authorities to uh, eliminate the white red white flag uh, from you know using from being used in public spaces. Uh, even people who have them in their own yards, uh, you know, get are sent to prisons, which just uh, is which is extraordinary. But my question is, do you think it can be easily replaced by something else? Um, for example, this embroidery or vushivanka. If it's not white, red, white, maybe people can agree something else. And if if they do, then will the authorities again crack down on it? So it's not really about the symbols. Uh, it's about what this symbol stands for, right? So it it, it can be a tricky process for the, for people who oppose the regime to come up with new symbols and then to let them, you know, be deeply entrenched. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Yarik. Um... So whoever's ready to respond first, go ahead. But and, the, and by the uh, way, uh, you, uh, our chair is also a distinguished expert in this area. So if, if our chair has any views, I would be interested as well. well. When uh, Yarek mentioned passport, something inside was like, yes, a terrible passport, that experience of uh, unpleasant travel obstacles all around. <laughs> so it's uh, less about the formal having the passport and more about the experience of being from this weird country that has the lowest citizenship status compared to others, compared to even Russia. 
um, I think, uh, Yari, that uh, it is not so easily uh, replaced this uh, white, red, white uh, symbols. Bushivankas uh, and other uh, symbols will go with them, but not instead, I think so. Uh, it is now also rather this um, some kind of uh, partisan uh, also uh, fight, yeah, and uh, I think it is also something what um, collecting uh, people, what uh, what uh, does uh, this feeling of uh, familiarity of the group of uh, creating this uh, this community, yeah, and uh, those. Uh, uh, photographs, those, uh, those um, uh, actions uh, that are made now uh, with small or bigger groups uh, when people show uh, the flags or, the, uh, or just the, uh, the symbolic, uh, it, um, uh, it is, uh, yeah, it is some kind of uh, showing uh, solidarity, it is one thing, and second, it is uh, this, this building of this, uh, of this, uh, of this society, and uh, secondly, it is also building uh, this long memory, yeah, so it is also very important that it is not, uh, uh, it was already told today, yeah, it's, it's not uh, only the memory of, um, of beginning uh, with the uh, Soviet Union, yeah, because roots, but uh, very long, uh, long, uh, long one, history. So um, I think uh, it won't be good even uh, to find and to try replace uh, these symbols to uh, to others. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Sasha has uh, other point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, Sasha. And just uh, to let everyone know, we have one more question um, in chat. Uh, okay, so I will be short um, regarding the passport identity. Um, I do think that it goes beyond the passport mentality. And by living in North America and talking to diverse groups, I know that this is the citizenship of the heart. Some people spend part of their life in Belarus and they feel solidarity. Some people's grandmother immigrated from Belarus at the turn of the century and are Jewish and their heart goes out for us, you know. So it's really, it's a diverse spectrum to discuss, but it's definitely beyond just the post-Soviet passport experience and it should be as such. Um, regarding the second question, the, the symbols and whether they could be replaced, I guess what we are looking at is the regime's potential to produce even more absurd responses and their potential to fight conceptually. And we have seen something similar in the revolutionary movements in Prague where many like absurdist um, elements have been used and also in Poland. Um, and I think it's a good moment to test this right now for the protesters, like what else would they fight? What else would they respond to? And whatever the authorities fight against might have a potential to become a symbol, but it is not clear right now. But I do agree with my colleague that the white, red and white flag is there to stay. Thank you, Sasha. So we have qu a question from Boris Cherny. Uh, Boris, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and word your question? Uh, it's about the, uh, thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation. It's about the, um, the heritage. Is there a kind of heritage, uh, um, cultural heritage of, um, that uh, demonstrators um, cultivate or say what that's uh, our inspiration Any thoughts on yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah, they manifest the tradition, uh, but um, 
it is very also interesting. Uh, maybe it is um, if I go uh, far from the slogans or uh, banners. Uh, if we, for example, see the music of protest, yeah, because uh, slogans are very, uh, very, uh, very. Uh, uh, short yeah but uh, they are also they are very often yeah the demonstrators goes uh, with uh, Mahutny Boja for example yeah with the hymnos uh, uh, they go with uh, other um, other great song Pahonia uh, uh, new uh, new music uh, that he, that was created in 2020 uh, after the elections, uh, for example, those uh, from my last uh, slide, there is a group from um, near to Mohilev, yeah, with this song, Menu uh, Bidwo, we are not, uh, uh, yeah, um, we are Belarusians. Uh, it is, uh, but um, it is also something to uh, go with uh, our tradition. Uh, secondly, uh, there are also a song uh, connected with uh, uh, Great Dutch of Lithuania, yeah, for example, um, yeah, this, uh, uh, oh gosh, I forgot the name of uh, the, um, Stary Olsa, yeah, uh, it's a group, yeah, so, uh, so uh, there is a lot of um, symbols uh, connecting with tradition and uh, his uh, cultural heritage, yeah, so I think it is also a part of uh, building this, um, this community, yeah? because it is very difficult to build something Without uh, without something uh, common, yeah. Even if we uh, if if we don't uh, talk about it um, like uh, about this uh, new Belarusian uh, identity, and we are rather thinking about this civic identity. Um, nevertheless, uh, common uh, symbols are more than needed. Yeah. All right, um, so uh, we're almost out of time, uh, two minutes left. So I wanted to thank um, you know, all the participants for great questions, the presenters for self-provoking talks. Uh, and I will uh, hand the baton to Yarek in case he has any final words or um, something to say in preparation for tomorrow. Thank you very much, Volga. It was a very interesting panel and I particularly appreciated the use of visual elements many interesting pictures and, and, and other illustrations. So we conclude uh, our conference, our first day of conference. And uh, tomorrow uh, we meet at uh, 1 p.m. There will be, there is a different uh, Zoom link, which you already uh, received. And we'll talk about history. We'll talk again about uh, protests uh, to some extent, because we'll discuss Belarusian uh, society. And, uh, and I'm sure that these questions of protests will come up again. And then the final panel will be on culture. And tomorrow it will be from 1 until 4.20. So it's much shorter than today. But thanks for staying with us until uh, the very end of this day. And I hope to see um, you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>